Welcome to Family Rights Group 30th Anniversary Celebrations. My name is Rosemary Jones and I'm the current chair of Family Rights Group. Family Rights Group was formed 30 years ago by a group of social workers, lawyers and academics in response to an acute sense of injustice in how families were being treated when they were involved with social services. Margaret Hodge, now Minister of State for Children, Young People and Families, recalls... Oh, when I first heard about Family Rights Group, that was 30 years ago, actually, when uh, uh, my husband and various other people I know were engaged in setting it up. And I think at that time, it was felt that a lot of uh, policies around children and action around children was taken without any sort of understanding of the fact that children grow up in families and trying to give a voice to families and locate policy of children in uh, around their families was what Family Rights Group was all about. The first meeting of what was to become Family Rights Group was called following anger about a case when a mother who sought help from the local authority to support her care for her child instead had him taken away from her and into care on a place of safety order. Eventually, the child was returned home, but only after members of the group had taken the case through to the Court of Appeal. The second reason for the meeting was to try and influence what was to become the Children Act 1975. Jo Tunnard was the first Chief Executive of Family Rights Group. So, if our people involved in those initial discussions that led to Family Rights Group, I think thought that um, if the Children Act 1975 was right, then then their job would be done. And of course it didn't happen like that because their in, their recommendations weren't weren't taken up and so the inequalities not only continued but, but got worse for families. Over the years we have worked with other organizations, with ministers, with local authorities and most importantly with families, bringing evidence of injustices to the attention of politicians practitioners and the media, giving families a voice and putting forward workable, evidence-based solutions in the interest of the child? Well, in the early days it was, it was very difficult. We were seen as challenging the status quo. We were seen as um, standing alongside families, enabling them to have their say in a way that hadn't happened before. Um, we were seen to be somehow acting against the interests of children when all we were trying to do was enable families to have their say and to explain why they thought what should happen, although different from the local authority, was still in the best interests of their child. There's no doubt that we were and are viewed as challenging and persistent and sometimes even as a thorn in the side of decision makers. The issues we raise are often not popular or likely to attract public sympathy. They may not be in fashion, and they certainly don't readily attract funding. Yet over the last 30 years working with others, we have had important successes that have transformed the experiences of children and their families. What was also happening was that um, research evidence was accumulating that was supporting the, the anxieties, the inequalities that Family Rights Group and other organisations were showing. It was this work from different perspectives that really led to, um, to the civil servants working very hard on a piece of legislation that ended up in the Children Act 1989. Many of the arguments when we first articulated them were regarded as too radical. Now they are accepted as best practice. For example, when Family Rights Group was set up, a committee of councillors could pass a resolution which removed parents' rights over their children without going to court and without the parents even being present. Now they can't. Then parents were not included in reviews of children in care and case conferences. Now working in partnership with parents underpins the legal framework for the care and protection of children. Then, grandparents had no legal means to seek contact with their grandchildren in care. 
Now they do. Angela Price has been involved with Family Rights Group for 20 years. She got in touch with us when her grandson was taken into care. Following four foster placements in as many months, the local authority decided to place her grandson for adoption, a decision that Angela, with Family Rights Group support, challenged in the European Court of Human Rights. Well, 20 years ago, our grandson was taken into care and we were told that as grandparents we had no rights, that we wouldn't see him anymore and to look on it as a bereavement. Of course, we wouldn't accept this. So they decided to take our case to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, we didn't win, but the outcome of that was that uh, the European Court responded by saying that the government of this land, because there was no legal rights for grandparents having contact with grandchildren in care, that they should look at the law and see about changing it. Angela's grandson was adopted, but with the support of his adoptive parents, Angela and her family remained in close contact with him. Donna, another of Angela's grandchildren, explains. There's me being the eldest, um, and then Damien is a year younger than me, who's my brother, and my younger sister Charlotte is five years younger than me. After the divorce, um, me and Charlotte and my dad um, moved in with uh, Nana and Dad, and, and then we, we lived there for years and years, up until me being like 18 and living, like moving away to go to uni really. The three of us are, are quite close and um, we always have been. Damien has always been able to talk to me about everything and I've always been able to talk to him about everything. You know, we've given each other advice, we help each other out. Um, we go out together over night time, we go out and go clubbing and have an absolute, just the two of us go out just together, the two of us and have, we can have just an excellent time. You know, it doesn't matter that we don't, or that we've never lived together and it just doesn't matter because it's, like I said before, it's just normal. So we have a very normal relationship, I think. Just a normal brother and sister relationship. The fact that we don't live together doesn't make it any different. I experienced an open adoption. When I first started and was fostering and we had preparation groups, etc., there were people there that were adamant that once the child was with them, there wouldn't have been any more contact with their birth parents, they were turning up a new leaf and I'm sad to say that most of those placements broke down. So I have always been interested in the rights of the child to make sure and that the child was involved as much as possible with the extended family. Children had a fantasy about what their birth family was like and sometimes it wasn't a realistic fantasy. But I felt that the more exposure that children have with their parents, then they can make informed decisions about where they want to be. A family group conference is a meeting attended by family and friends who are invited to consider the needs of the child and the issues that the child is facing. The family members have private time during the meeting to consider ways in which the difficulties the child is facing can be addressed. So if I take one instance of, I think, a very powerful uh, experience I had with family rights groups, it was around the family conferencing when you brought in to see me, a group of uh, children and their families, and the way that you'd worked with them, with the children and their families, to try and resolve some issues without recourse to litigation and the court processes, and I thought that was very powerful. And as you know, we're now trying to see how we can build on that innovation that you developed uh, to see it more mainstreamed. A group conference was held earlier this year to address the behaviour of three brothers, Christopher, Nicky and Jake. Because we got into a lot of trouble and now I stay. We could have got that kicked out of our house by a council or something if we carried on. Uh, before the family conference, there was a very close-kit family, but you did sort of find they were getting in trouble and this one was blaming that one and that one was blaming that one. Because and... 
they was always going out and like they'd swear at people and throw things at people. And it was only for the past, I'd say two and a half years since their dad died, that was when everything went downhill. When they all were in that room together, it was really nice because they actually got to the point of like, they could all share how they actually felt. I think it was good we had the meeting because we sat around the table to discuss about what we've done and what we'd like to do for around our area. And we had private time for ourselves to discuss what we wanted to do. The family group conference was, it was really good for our family. It was because it's, as it's, it sort of like showed them the way, I suppose. Like, where not to be naughty all the time. There is people out there that will sit and listen to you. You don't have to be naughty all the time. So, they have, they was really pleased with the family group conference, the kids actually. They were happy about that. I don't reckon we're getting to more trouble with learning a lesson to what we've, by what we've done. Michelle contacted the Family Rights Group Advice Line after years of trying to get support for her son who has severe behavioural difficulties. Unable to get the support her son needed and with two young daughters to care for, she became desperate. Her son is currently voluntarily placed in care whilst Michelle, with an advocate from Family Rights Group, continues to press for him to have the services he needs. If your child's being like that, you don't know what to do. Obviously, if they need psychiatric help or whatever it is they need, and you can't give it to them because you're not professional in that way to give it to them. I had a conversation with a lady on the advice line, and she was very positive. And, you know, the stuff that I told her, she said that what they could do for me. So she arranged for somebody um, to come and see me and discuss go through exactly, or go over what's happened and I've been getting support from family rights since then. It gave me an opportunity to have a voice because if I didn't have an advocate there then I wouldn't have had a voice. I wouldn't have actually been able to express how I felt about the situation and sort of be totally honest and explain why things had happened and how it had escalated and what has been going on. If a family is suddenly involved in issues around child protection, it's incredibly stressful for all concerned. And it's important in trying to ensure that you really do promote the best interests of the child, that you can support the families in uh, advocating for themselves. If you suddenly open the door and social workers come in, police come in, you're, you're uh, accused of all sorts of uh, 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 cr crimes, really, in relation to the way you're caring for your child, uh, it can be a really scary experience. And whilst we've always got to say the interests of the child have to be paramount, nevertheless, working with the family to ensure that they can articulate their viewpoint properly and working with the family to try and resolve any issues that may be around so that the child can maintain a strong relationship with their uh, birth parents is very important. So independent advocacy, support is a crucial part of effective uh, policy to protect and safeguard children. Yet despite the commitment, determination, hard work and generosity of many who have been instrumental in helping us to achieve so much, we know from the daily calls we receive on our advice line, from our advocacy work and from our project work, that there is still much more that needs to be done. Family Rights Group wants to see that any child who is potentially in need is entitled to an accurate assessment of their needs drawing on specialist advice as necessary. We want to see a basic entitlement to independent advice and advocacy for all families who are involved with social services, so that children and parents are enabled to have a clearer understanding of the process in which they are involved and greater ownership of decisions being made about their lives. Also, we want to see that families have the option of a family group conference early in the process of any child welfare or protection case, 
in order that services draw upon the strengths of the wider family and friends network to meet the needs of the child wherever possible. Lastly, we want greater support, including financial assistance that enables children who can't live with their parents to be brought up wherever possible by people with whom they can bond and who know and love them. Well, just, I, w I just think that any family that's having any problem with um, social services, they really need to get in touch with family rights. No matter what the situation is, you should never be ashamed of your circumstances. You, should, you know, you should, if you need help and it's for, the, it's for the benefit of your children, you know, you should always get in touch with family rights. I think so, because they've helped me so much. If you would like to find out more about Family Rights Group, become a member or send us a donation to take forward the work highlighted in this video. Then you can contact us at the Print House, 18 Ashwin Street, London, E83DL. Or you can telephone 0207 923-2628 or email office at frg.org.uk